Hey everybody, Chris Farad here. Welcome to a new campaign playthrough of Phoenix Point. I'm going to let the introduction roll, and I'll see you on the other side. In what may be the hottest year in history, scientists have recorded radical changes to the permafrost in Antarctica. The Pandora virus, a so-called giant virus with the largest genome size ever recorded. The crabs also display increased aggression, even towards larger predators. A striking new weather anomaly has claimed many coastlines around the world. NASA is examining these clouds to figure out... We've detected large amounts of an organic composite. So far, the sample doesn't match any of the DNA we've compared it with. We all saw it. Those creatures coming out of the sea on that oil rig. The president has declared a national emergency. It's obvious that what we're dealing with here is a biological weapon. As of today, we are at war. It's taking their minds. I saw them walk right into the sea. Thousands of people. Thousands. The mist is gone, but the city is dead. The roads are broken. You must join one of the havens. Do not attempt to survive on your own. All right, here we go. I'm stoked to start a playthrough of Phoenix Point. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, it's similar to XCOM, as you would imagine. It is being designed by Julian Gollop. He's the mind behind the original XCOM franchise. And I've been lucky enough to have access to this release of Phoenix Point for the last few days. And I will say that it's got a couple of really cool mechanics that make it stand out compared to some of the more modern XCOM releases that we're used to, especially on this channel. Um, Phoenix Point's out tomorrow, December 3rd but Snapshot Games have allowed me to bring it to you guys a little bit early, so thank you to them for that. And I'm going to be uploading this pretty regularly in the coming days, so if you want to be notified of those, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell for when those go live. Also, if you're buying the game anyways and you enjoy what I do, uh, consider using the link in the description as it does help out the channel. So let's dive in. Let's begin. We're going to play on Legend difficulty. Uh, there's four different difficulties to choose from. The higher the difficulty, the fewer starting soldiers we have, the faster enemies get stronger, uh, shorter timelines and things like that. So we're going to go on Legend. Might be very difficult, but we're going to try and persevere. I'm not going to go through the tutorial. If you want to see what the tutorial entails, uh, the official Phoenix Point channel has a couple of videos already. Uh, showing you the tutorial, but uh, we're just going to dive right in and I'll explain all of the mechanics as we go. So, let's begin. The Phoenix Project was founded on October 24th, 1945. The second war to end all wars was over, but there were those who understood that we could no longer afford to think in terms of nations and empires. For a time, the Phoenix Project successfully navigated the political conflicts of its era. That was our golden age. Phoenix Project operatives scoured the world for clues. We had bases in two dozen countries. Even the heavens were not off limits. But out there, on the far side of the moon, began our downfall. The failure of the Phoenix 2 mission exposed us to our enemies in the UN. Stripped of resources and scattered to the winds, we were reduced to a secret, a memory. When the Pandora virus woke up, we should have been the first line of defense. When huge clouds of mist appeared over the sea, when people started vanishing, we should have figured out what was going on. And when those people started coming back, changed, hostile, alien, we should have been ready to fight, but we failed. The ecosystem started to change, imperceptibly at first, then faster and faster. Three factions arose. New Jericho, trying to restore order and purity. Sinedrin, hoping to build a world without hierarchies. And the Disciples of Anu, a new syncretic religion dedicated to adaptation and biological change. At war with the world and at odds with each other, these factions cannot find a way forward. Now the mist is returning and armies are rising from the sea. Without the Phoenix Project, humanity will fall. It's time to rise from the ashes. Okay, so this is the Phoenix Point Geoscape. And if you've never seen any of the backer builds or you're unfamiliar with the game at all, this might look a little bit overwhelming. Uh, this is not 
intended to be a full tutorial, but I'm going to talk about things as they come up and then we'll dive in deeper when we need to. Uh, before we start, the important thing to know is that anytime you're moving around the geoscape, time is progressing. So you might as well take advantage of that happening and start some research projects and maybe some uh, facility building at your base. So let's go into our research tab. We have one thing available called atmospheric analysis. So we've managed to connect to some of the remaining weather satellites. We should use these to assess the extent of the new mist outbreak global mist monitoring system available when this is done. What that is is going to track this mist on the globe and uh, we're going to be able to see where that is and make decisions about which missions we take because of it. If you're fighting inside of the mist, things are a lot uh, more difficult. So you may want to take that into account when picking which missions you're going after. Uh, the second thing, if we look in our bases tab, you can see our base is actually fairly well established. Uh, we've got access lift, fabrication plants, research labs, satellite uplink, which is really important, energy, medical bays, living quarters, and a store. All of these different things. But the most important thing I want to point out is that we have three materials right now, tech, uh, materials, or I should say three resources, and food. Food is the only one that's going down currently, and every day we're losing four food. That's bad because food is what's used to recruit new soldiers, and so I'm going to recommend that we build a food production unit. This is a facility that generates enough food for eight soldiers each day, and it also takes three full days to build. So let's get that started now. And that way we can recruit soldiers from Havens when that becomes available. Okay, so when we're looking at uh, this screen, we see our Manticore down here and current inhabitants inside of this. I've gone ahead and customized four starting soldiers that I got from Discord. And if you guys want to become a soldier in this campaign, then uh, just leave a comment down below uh, with the name. You don't have to separate first name, nickname, last name. It's all just one field. And then there's some very basic customization options. There's not as much as XCOM 2, for example, but I'm sure over time and if mods get enabled, then this will go pretty crazy. Uh, so you've got basic things here like uh, body type, male, female. Uh, head, hair, facial hair, hair color, eye color, voice, primary color, secondary color, and then an armor pattern. Uh, so our first recruit is our heavy class. On this difficulty, we always start with a heavy, a sniper, and two assault classes. You get a bunch of really cool classes as you start to work with the factions and stuff. And so you're not just limited to these basic ones that Phoenix Point has. And eventually you find some really cool stuff. Uh, so Marshall Scadden is our first... Uh, our first recruit, and this is our heavy class. I'm going to go through this screen once we start dealing with promotions and such. For now, I'll keep this open so that you can see what some of these customization options look like. Uh, our second recruit is Catherine Cat McCall. She's our sniper. Pretty cool and uh, really neat looking helmet. Kind of reminds me of Reapers a little bit. Uh, we've got Cassandra Fulton as our first assault class. Looking pretty cool. And then Vignesh Shan Mugam, our second assault class. And uh, you can see what his helmet looks like here. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start scanning some of these sites. Um, because we have a satellite uplink in here, this is going to allow us to initiate area scans to locate other sites of interest. So all of these current sites are unexplored. We have to go and explore them with our ship, spend some time there. Notice, pay attention over here. So we're January 1st, 2047. You're going to see how much time passes as we're moving around the map. And then we've got kind of our uh, queue that, of things that we're working on on this side. This uh, yellow or orange dotted line that's going around here indicates our maximum travel range. But every time that we stop somewhere, it resets. So kind of think of it as like you're fueling up. So what you're going to notice once we start getting access to a larger portion of the world map, uh, we're going to be going through sites to get to our destination. Um, this is a faithfully recreated globe as it looks today. Um, we are currently starting in Africa. It looks like I had to look this up, but this looks like an Ethiopia type area. So, okay, let's uh, begin. We're going to start going up here and I'm going to initiate an area scan. It costs a little bit of uh, materials and some tech, but it's really important. Uh, you're going to notice it brings up a green kind of radar. As time is passing, that radar is going to be slowly expanding 
and pinging off new sites that we can then explore. So this is our way of expanding our access to the globe. Now, ideally, we're looking for a scavenging mission here. Uh, something that we can go out and try to protect some crates from aliens attacking them so that we can then get more tech, more materials, and more food. Uh, but let's explore and see what we find here. Notice to scan the site takes about four or five hours. So this is the Dreamers Awaken, Fort Hayek. It's a haven run by New Jericho, which is one of the three factions. This means that normally things are quiet and under control, but right now there's an emergency. A group of soldiers is on a killing spree. It began with strange dreams, voices heard in the night, a local doctor tells our operatives. I could not detect any physiological changes, and there were certainly no signs of infection, but their behavior simply cannot be explained by PTSD or similar conditions, which we at New Jericho are sadly quite familiar with. It's like something has driven them mad. Sounds familiar with the uh, opening cinematics. If we stop these soldiers, New Jericho will undoubtedly be grateful to us. So there's uh, a mission to stop a group of rampaging soldiers. Now, I'm telling you, you could try this, uh, <laughs> but it's, at this difficulty, it's gonna be very tough. Ideally, we find a scavenging site, and we probably should within our first little area here, but um, let's keep exploring. This is gonna start pinging off sites, and eventually we'll go back and we'll do this mission. Uh, to help these guys. Research complete. All right, so the uh, atmospheric analysis is done. Reprogramming of our satellite systems revealed the extent of the new mist outbreak. The origin sites are in coastal sea regions, as in the previous two incursions, but the activity level seems higher, posing a serious threat to remaining life on Earth. Havens caught within the mist will be at risk of an attack, so we should explore mist-covered regions thoroughly and defend any havens trapped within them. Our geoscape monitoring systems have been updated with current mist coverage. So that global mist monitoring system is now available. And that is this. This is pretty unlucky for us because anything that happens within this uh, mist makes missions more difficult. And so if we're going to be fighting in there, that's kind of scary that it's so close to our main base and our current area of uh, exploration. We have uh, new research available. And you'll also notice that we have a, an objective here now to complete the Phoenix Archives. So the Phoenix Archives is something saying we've discovered a batch of encrypted materials or files on the mainframe of the newly reclaimed Phoenix base. According to the file names, they these are the Phoenix Archives or what remains of them. So let's queue that up. And then because we met with a haven from uh, New Jericho, New Jericho is a militaristic organization founded by the enigmatic billionaire Tobias West. If this completes, then we get some extra materials to use. So let's queue these up. You can switch these around if you want. I like to just throw all available research in and then I kind of queue it up uh, the way that I want. But since this is an objective, let's uh, get the Phoenix Archives going and that will unlock a special mission for us eventually. Okay, let's start exploring these sites. Ideally, as I say, we look for and find a scavenging site. So it's something basic that we can kind of uh, get some, our soldiers some experience on and things like that. Now, uh, this is another haven run by Caitlin Brahim. This one here is run by uh, Elif Lopez. All of the havens have individual leaders and then they all kind of report into one faction. So right now in our diplomacy area, we only see uh, the new Jericho faction led by Tobias West. And so we're going to likely find a bunch of havens in the similar area. So we just pinged off on a new unexplored site there. So you can see we now have access to get up in this area. Let's go ahead and explore this. Okay, so the fire within Sumer. This is another faction at the Disciples of Anu Haven of Sumer. A mutated worm infestation is causing serious problems. The locals had placed their hopes in Taxiarch Nergal, the disciples' greatest military hero. But the, but the Nergal, or sorry, but Nergal is said to be fighting a series of pitched battles against the Pandorans and has been unable to help. We could eradicate the infestation ourselves, helping the Haven and creating a good first impression with this faction. So the common thing that you're seeing here is when we find a new faction for the first time, there's going to be a mission that we can take on to help them. And that's going to help us develop our relationships with them. As these relationships improve, we are going to trigger certain special missions to, um, to handle for these guys. And then we get bigger rewards as our diplomacy with them improves. This unlocked the Disciples of Anu 
Uh, research, said to have been a series of cultist sects before the Third World War, disciples of Anu have grown to become one of the greatest powers in what is left of our world. Not much is known about their religion other than other that they embrace the mutations brought by the Pandora virus and are ruled by a leader referred to only as the Exalted. Now this gives food, which is really nice, as I've been alluding to. We need this for recruiting soldiers. So I'm actually going to bump this ahead of New Jericho uh, and then bring the Phoenix Archives back up top. Okay, let's go out here. Still looking for a scavenging site that we should find relatively soon. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to go here and take on our first battle. We need to eliminate all enemies to reclaim these crates. Now, <laughs> word of warning. Uh, on this difficulty, some of these crates are going to go. There's literally no way to stop it, and you'll see that. Um, the main thing is, is just try to get the crates that we're next to, because there's going to be more enemies than we have soldiers, so we're going to be outnumbered. Uh, threat level is low. Light level, you might be wondering, what does this matter? Uh, this impacts our perception. So at night, we don't see as far as we could during the day. I think the enemies suffer the same uh, weakness there, but uh, that does change things, and you can make some uh, tactical decisions based on this. And then the enemy type is Pandoran. So sometimes we'll be fighting Pandoran. Most of the time, we'll be fighting Pandoran. But we're also sometimes dealing with the other factions or independent groups, and that's why the enemy type is listed. Okay, let's get into our first mission. There's a couple things we need to do here before we head out. You'll notice uh, health and stamina over here. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You'll notice that they're all on the manticore right now, indicated by this icon. This weapon with the exclamation is saying that there's an empty item slot. So you can load these guys up to their maximum level of encumbrance without any penalties. Everything that you see here has a certain weight associated with it. So this med kit, it's got a weight of two. If we put this in there, it's going to bring his encumbrance over. So we're not going to do that. There's actually only one thing we could add with him, but um, we might save this for our other soldiers for a couple of different reasons. His mobility is not that great because he's wearing this really heavy armor and we want him to be our tank. He's our heavy unit. He needs to be up close. He needs to be able to absorb some damage. Um, but every piece of armor has positive and negative impacts. So he's got a ton, uh, like a really high armor rating, but his speed is impacted, his stealth and his accuracy, accuracy is impacted. Uh, this specific piece of gear has an ability called Jet Jump. Uh, so some of the equipment actually has special uh, features attached to them, which is kind of cool. Uh, so he's fine. This, we're going to leave him how he is. Uh, Catherine Cat McCall, she's got some space. We're going to give an extra uh, clip. Everything in Phoenix Point has to be managed from uh, carrying enough clips so you don't run out of ammo to uh, making sure that you guys have med kits when possible. Like this all has to be done and it will become kind of second nature the more that you do it, but it can be really overwhelming early on. Uh, we could also throw in an extra clip here uh, because we've got the space. And I think that's probably fine. On our assaults, I'm going to give them each a med kit. They're, they're our weakest class right now because they kind of have to be mid-range. So they're going to be, uh, if, if we don't kill the enemy as soon as we see them, these guys are likely going to take some damage. So we'll bring the med kits on them. We'll also bring an extra clip. And let's see. You're already carrying a grenade. Let's do a clip here. And let's maybe... In that case, let's throw a grenade here. That's fine. And I'll even throw one here. Why not? She's likely going to be super far back, but um, everybody carries one and we'll just, we'll make it work. Okay, so everyone's ready to go. We can ignore this because we can't fill that slot. Let's uh, deploy our squad and we'll talk about how combat is very different from XCOM. And it allows for actually a pretty decent amount of flexibility in the way that you approach things. When we load in here, you're going to notice that uh, each of our soldiers has four action points. And we can use those action points however we want. We can uh, move and shoot. We can shoot a couple times depending on the gun. Look at the Manticore. looking pretty good. PX-08. No big deal. Coming in hot. 
Uh, you're only limited by basically your imagination and the total number of action points. So uh, you can see here. So let's take a look with, uh, yeah, Vignesh is, is a good example. So the first thing to point out is uh, you'll see under his health bar, that blue bar there, uh, four different action points represented. If we start to move our cursor around, you're going to see that as we progress past these boundaries, we're going to see new boundaries set, and then sometimes they change color. The reason it's changing color is because this weapon, this Ares assault rifle, uh, requires two action points. You can see indicated by the bars underneath. So what these, what these are representing, these boundaries, if I were to move here, it's going to be my first action point consumed. And you can actually see that all along the way, that action point is kind of broken down into four separate um, tiles. So the further I go out, the more that piece of that action point drops. So once I go here, that's a full action point, and I could shoot from here. I could also go out to here, still have two action points left, and shoot from there. But once I cross that, it's saying, okay, now you're in the yellow zone, you can't take any shots um, if you go to this position. So it's a really flexible system, which is quite nice. Uh, if we look at somebody like our heavy here, Marshall, um, his movement is seriously hindered compared to the rest. And so we have to make some pretty ballsy maneuvers. He does have this jet jump, which uses a combination of action points, which are those blue bars, and will points. Uh, will points are generally used for special abilities. So you'll see here he's got six. Everybody has six right now. Um, but as you start to level these guys up, they're going to get more perks that utilize will points. And so you have to keep that in mind. Because of his weapon, which requires three actions, this doesn't leave a lot of flexibility. Once we move him somewhere, he's there without the ability to act right now. Um, and then we have our sniper, who's got um, kind of a similar issue because her gun requires three action points to use. So she's a little bit limited in that respect. The cool thing about this system is if you hit X to go through your different equipped items, uh, this thing, the, the boundaries adjust to that. So it knows, now I'm talking about using our Cypher handgun here. And so it's saying, okay, your blue range maximum is over here where you could still take a shot. Or if I just stood in this location, because it only requires one action, I could take four shots from here. So that's a basic... You guys get it. That's basically how things work here. Now, we're trying to save these crates. There's eight of them. And we have a decent stockpile over here. We have these ones that are really close to us. And if we're lucky, we might be able to save these. And that's if we're lucky. So we're going to start exploring here. I'm going to put... Um, let's see... Let's put Vignesh out here. You'll notice there are things like full and half cover, but the reasons that those that, that matter are very different from XCOM. XCOM, everything is percentage-based, and here things aren't quite like that. Um, we'll get into that more when we can start targeting enemies. So let's see. We'll get into, like... I think we'll just bring everybody up if we can. If we can set up an overwatch, we will. We have no indication of where the enemies are, but they're going to go beelining for these crates. And like this crate, there's no way we're getting that one. Uh, these ones would be amazing. These are probably unlikely. But as our squad gets stronger, and by, I mean, by stronger, I mean we get more people, uh, that stuff will change. Let's move uh, Skadden all the way over here. No enemies spotted yet. And for Catherine... Let's just put her here so that we can uh, overwatch. And we'll put overwatch on a couple of people. Cool thing about overwatch in Phoenix Point is you can really set up um, exactly where you want this to fire. So typically in something like XCOM, you'd say, okay, overwatch, anything that comes in here, just uh, shoot at it. But you can use this strategically to guard different doorways or to um, just have more control over what areas you want to be overwatching in. Uh, you might be wondering, okay, well, why don't I just overwatch this entire thing? Because if an enemy does show back here, it's going to be highly inaccurate, and you're basically just going to waste bullets. And ammo is kind of scarce. You have to manually reload your guns and stuff and make sure that you bring ammo on missions. So it's something to be uh, 
considering, for sure. I am going to do something like this. Kind of overwatch down this road. See if anything shows there. We can't do anything with Marshall, so I'm going to hit space, enter standby. Same thing here. There's nothing I can do at this moment. And then we'll set up an overwatch down here. Now, her range as a sniper, she's a lot more accurate. So I'm okay if anything shows up in here uh, to take a shot. Let's uh, rock and roll. If you guys have questions about that... Oh, nice. Hopefully we can see this. Oh, that's good. That thing's going to go. Okay, so the reason this doesn't fire is because... Take a look here. Um, well, I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure why it didn't fire. Uh, I'm not sure. I feel like we probably should have gotten an overwatch on that. But either way, I'm okay with it. It didn't damage any stuff. Um, so let's talk about how Aiming. how damage and stuff works in Phoenix Point. First thing to pay attention to is this is the health bar at the top of this Arthrin. He's got 170 health right now, 13 general armor, but every body part has its own health and armor rating. Uh, the wider that this section is, this is the potential damage we can deal, which is 90 because it's uh, 110 damage times one shot minus 13 armor. And I think this always just rounds up. So this is saying you're going to do approximately 90 damage. If this was uh, anywhere between like 11 and 20, it's going to reduce it by 20. Um, either way, when we look in close, so we can hit this, or what I like to do is we just zoom in and do it. You get pretty quick at this, actually. Uh, we can target individual body parts and each of these body parts, if they're disabled, has a certain thing that kind of happens. So the head, for example, this is a nice thing to target with our snipers because we're highly accurate. It's got no armor, as you can see indicated there, whereas the carapace has 20 armor on its own. Um, if you disable the head, it causes bleeding, reduces willpower, which is what lets them do some of their special abilities, removes 20 of their maximum HP, and it removes an ability called Spit Poison which does 10 damage, 20 piercing, which is dealing with armor. Uh, it inflicts 60 poison damage per turn, which is insane amounts because our soldiers do not have a ton of health right now. Uh, it's got an effective range of five and it costs two action points for them to use. Now, before we take this shot, you might be looking at this, you're thinking, okay, well, how do we know what our chances to hit this thing are? Look at just our reticule here for a second. I'm gonna put it on a, on a black spot so we can explain this. The outer reticule, the uh, darker teal, if we take a shot here, our shot is going to land within that larger circle. That smaller circle in the, circle in the middle uh, is a 50% chance of landing shots in there. So for somebody like our sniper, this circle is like really small and we know that if we take this shot, we're gonna at least hit this alien and 50% chance at this range we're going to uh, hit the head because the head is fully encircled within this. If we look at somebody like our assault, On it. okay, this is showing if we just took the shot from here, the, remember the wider that this is, the more likely it is to happen. So these are pretty high likelihood chances to hit. Um, but these guys operate differently. Notice how there's six individual um, slices here. It's because this gun, this assault rifle, shoot six times and each bullet can deal 30 damage and then it's reduced by the potential armor so he's got uh 13 armor rated here but because if we zoom in we notice his carapace has 20 i think it's taking like the maximum potential armor there and reducing it but anyways that works a little bit differently because in phoenix point every bullet is measured individually so we could take these shots and when we zoom in 100% of our shots will be within that larger outer circle. 50% of our shots should land within that uh, smaller circle in the middle. And so that's a key point of difference between our assaults and our sniper. Six shots are going to be fired. So anyways, um, let's see. Do we want to... The nice thing about being here is we can actually shoot twice because this is only two action points. We could move in to get a higher... Um, uh, to get closer. The closer we are, the better chance we're going to hit with every gun. And so I'm just going to take this shot from here. I feel like it's pretty good. Now, yes, we're 
on the torso here, but our shots are going to scatter anywhere within the circle. So I could go over here, but you'll notice that we have like that whole left side that's empty, that's missable. So I would like to just take this shot in the middle and let her rip. Okay, nice. So we did a, we hit a couple of things there. Notice um, we did some pincer damage. Where is that? Where's this pincer? There it is. So this has been uh, dealt some damage. Ideally, we're just going to take this other shot and hope that we end up killing him. Um, because if you notice at the top, these are all pretty white. It's a pretty high likelihood. And you don't have to zoom in every time. But I will say, you're kind of at a disadvantage if you don't. So the quick way that I do it is I hit F and I just start scrolling the zoom wheel, get my target. And for him, we're just kind of spraying at this general area. Let's go again. Very nice. This is a pretty high HP uh, unit for right now. So I'm okay if um, we need a couple of shots to deal with him. I'm going to hold our sniper for a second, only because I want to see if we can find any other enemies. Um, we know that one's over here. That's what this is indicating. We saw that it was doing some things. Um, the crates themselves are not cover. This is okay cover. Let's, uh, let's take this. Okay, so we did spot a new enemy. And he's just sitting down here. This isn't bad. It might look like it's not bad. Uh, but when we zoom in, we see, okay... This whole deal is in front of us. And one of the really cool things about Phoenix Point is that this cover is like not something that you would generally be considering in XCOM unless it's a big super machine like this. Um, but it does come into play in uh, Phoenix Point. So notice like these, this is not quite as white as the other one, so it's like our chances to hit are a little bit low. You can see the flashlight from our lights actually hitting the bottom piece of this. Now, some of our shots might break this and then get through and damage him. That's something to think about if we want. Uh, we can take a look at the info on these Arthrons and see what they have. So he's got his spitter head that spits poison. He's got an organic grenade launcher, which is, that's gonna be our worst enemy here. And then we've got a pincer as well. Uh, for his melee damage. So we could try and take this shot, but um, it's a little bit questionable. Skadden, you're going to notice he is like highly inaccurate. What I'm looking for here, so notice that blue arrow or that blue line. That's saying that we will have line of sight there. Um, let's move over here. It's going to use almost all of our action points. And... Just to give you an idea, like this, this is very unlikely to hit. Basically a 50% chance that it lands in that middle area, but even still it could hit this barrier over here. Um, so let's hold off on that. The other thing to consider is how we're going to deal with that other fella that we just found. And I'm looking for maybe a line of sight with Catherine all the way through to that unit, but I don't think we're going to get it. So we might just be in our best interest here to uh, pick this kill up. And we'll go right here. There's no armor on the head. It's a pretty good chance. We're definitely going to kill the unit regardless. Oh, we didn't? So, okay. Well, there you go. We disabled the arm. We hit the pincer. And again, that little variance that can be in there with that outer circle, nothing is, uh, nothing is for certain. We did inflict bleeding, which is good. We've disabled his arm, which is good, uh, but he still has the grenade launcher. Uh, he needs 10 more damage to die because he's going to bleed 10 as well. Uh, that's concerning for me because he's still alive. So I'm actually going to take this shot and I'm going to hope that we hit this. We didn't. But hey, we let them know that we're here and we mean business. Uh, he is standing in the open. Maybe this guy goes for him with the grenades. That would be best case scenario. Um, I can't quite reach him. We could make an argument, and this is another cool thing. We can free target, and we could try and like blow through these walls because we only need to inflict a little bit of damage. But then we have our food crate, and I don't really want to damage that. So we're kind of in a weird spot. But anyway, let's, um, let's fire over here, and we'll see if we get any of these. A couple of bullets hit him. I'm okay with that. And I'm actually just going to break vision here 
keep this thing more between us and see what he does. Um, if I can avoid this guy being able to see me, let's force him to do something. And if anything, maybe go for our, our heavy. Okay, so he's going for the food, which is really sad for me, because I think this guy's just going to destroy it. And food is so crucial right now. Oh, he didn't. Okay, so he's out of action points. All right, let's... um. Hmm. Let's see. He's dead now because of the uh, bleed damage. He's only got 10 HP. He's going to bleed that out, no problem. So now what we can do is focus our efforts on the other guy. Uh... With Scott, and it's going to be a bit rough because I don't want to sway and hit that thing, and it's kind of messy. We really just want to move him in closer uh, for next time. Let's see. You've got some pretty good shots here. Um, we'll put this right into the torso area. Just try to make sure he's as full in the circle as possible. Very nice. We should actually be able to take him out without moving. Let's uh, get in close again. And you don't have to manually aim this if you don't want. But I like to do it just to kind of control. It gives me a, a sense of control anyways. Um, if we want, we can let the bleed out happen. I think we will. And we'll use this opportunity to uh, maybe jump out here. Let's get Give it a cool opportunity to show off his jetpack. No big deal. It's a little risky because we don't know if any enemies are over in this section, but worked out okay in this situation. Now, uh, this guy has since moved in this location. It's not bad. Uh, let's take this cover here, and we'll set an overwatch down in that area. We'll let this guy bleed out. Let's say something like this. So if he comes out of that building, we've got him covered. And then we'll use the opportunity to move Cat down here. Top. And then she'll have that road covered for next time. Also, you'll notice on the map uh, we have this outer uh, wall. That's obviously the barriers. We can't pass those. But you're also going to notice that there's some little um, alien heads here. These represent where reinforcements can come from. Uh, things go haywire. Okay, so that guy didn't do any damage, which is nice. They're actually going pretty easy on us right now. I just want to see if anything shows, and it doesn't. Dashing Let's get him in closer. Still no eyes on. Now, there's also these crates out here, and what's really cool about um, Phoenix Point is you've got this whole, like, inventory management system, uh, so we can find stuff in here to use right now if we wanted to. Uh, we do have to keep in mind our action points. The other thing this does is um, in, it re or it increases the will points that we have. So if we have some spent, like on him, we could bring him over here, and that will increase will points. Enemies dying and killing enemies uh, with specific soldiers also increases will points. Something to keep in mind. Um, hmm. We know where they are. It's just a matter of where they're going to go. Are they? They have no more crates there. So they're likely going to have to come out here. And we might be able to get some overwatches. I think we're just going to have to make a full dash here. And then with our sniper, it's not really a lot here. It's all walls, so very unlikely to just to be able to hit anything. Uh, let's see. Let's go here for now. So that we can hopefully have uh, some line of sight next turn. We'll set up your overwatch on this door. Providing overwatch. And then let's wait. I do want to have... What are they doing in there? Oh, hello. Here we go. Very nice. Disabled the head, which is good. Equipment's damaged. They can still use it. But we did reduce his will points pretty considerably. So that was really nice. Plus now, I actually have a chance to do some damage with this gun. And this is the key. I feel like these heavies, funnily enough, work really well in tight and closed spaces. Because they can tank a lot of shots. Um, but their gun needs to be really close to be able to hit. So, 
Uh, even if we hit this carapace, the amount of damage is 180. It destroys 10 armor, and uh, I feel like this is fine. See the damage that came out there? It's basically one shot, one kill. But uh, I'll be honest, it's kind of rare that that, that uh, opportunity presents itself. Okay, there's still two more here. Let's, um, let's bring her over here. I'm going to have to overwatch this. I can't really get back there with her. Let's bring up Big Nesh here. And no vision. We could look at throwing a grenade. Um, the cool thing is, is, and we'll get into this when we start doing some level ups, but um, each of these soldiers has three different attributes as well. Strength, will, and speed. And strength impacts your HP, but also your throwing distance. So notice, like, we can't throw super far here. Uh, if they had higher strength, they'd be able to, and we could break down this wall or something. But uh, anyways, he's in the full cover there. Let's go back to the gun, and we'll set up an overwatch. Where is he likely to go? He might cross this path, because he can't just go through the wall to this guy. If I set this, this also covers that middle section. And the uh, exposed doorway here. Let's go for it. And then we'll do something similar here. Maybe cover that left side as well. I'm trying to get that left side, that open doorway, and that middle section. We'll see. Holding position. Oh, really? Okay, then. Very nice. You got that crate. Well played. Well played. Well played. Okay. I could just run in there and try and tank that. Um, who do these guys see? We do see this guy. Okay. I would love if this guy was a little bit more to the left. Um... If we go for the leg, pretty high likelihood that we hit based on the wall that he's behind. Very good. Leg is disabled, which is going to drastically reduce his movement. But I feel like we can probably Aiming. get this kill. So notice those white bars over his health. Uh, not super good, but we don't need every shot to land here. Um, he is bleeding. Engaging. But it's really like, let's, you know what, I'm going to aim here, and we'll see if this is cover that can be uh, taken down. Some can, some can't. You kind of have to just experiment. Okay, well, we did get a stray there. This one, let's go a little bit more in that middle section. We're damaging his pincer, but that's about it. I really don't want this guy to, uh, to survive. So I'm going to try and get as good of a shot as I can. I move here and take a shot. We would still have an action point left. This feels much better. Very cool. So we can do that, and then we can still move into cover. Okay. Then, I'm thinking I might just get right in here. Or maybe somewhere over on this side. But likely he just comes down and flanks me, which I don't love. And I don't have any cover between us and there. Hmm. On the move. This is a shot I might actually consider taking. When we aim in, I don't really have a viable option, so never mind. Let's see if he comes this way. I'll let an Overwatch fly here. And then just chill. Whoa, okay. Okay. Well played. Well played. So we got to figure out a way to take that down. Let's switch to a grenade. And our range is actually okay. Let's toss it. Two action points. Very cool. And it's still, there's a big chunk of it up there. Hmm. We don't have a good visual on him. Uh, it looks like we... Oh, okay. It actually does look like we 
did a pretty good job. Um, let's see. Sometimes line of sight can be a little tricky when we zoom in. Like, if you'll notice here, it looks like this guy should have a really good shot on this, but he's not in range for whatever reason. And if we zoom in, we've got this whole thing. Uh, normally, it factors in the step out, but uh, that might just come down to... Uh, practice. Now, we're out of ammo here. We do need to reload. This is going to cost an action point to do this. So, let's go ahead and do it. We can move up. On my way. Get into cover and then take our shot. Let this fly somewhere with the least amount of armor possible. That's a lot into the carapace. Let's go here. Very cool. And then lastly, we'll, let's get uh, Cat to pick this up. Okay, I think that's all of them. Very nice. Not bad for a first scavenge mission, actually. We got a lot more crates than I was expecting. Okay, nobody got a promotion, but that's okay. Um, experience points are shared between all of our uh, soldiers, and then the ones that get kills get a little bit more. Uh, so you can see how the sharing is broken down over here. We've got two skill points added to the pool because there's a an individual... Uh, soldier pool, and there's an individual, or there's a group pool that they can all pull from. Similar to, uh, to XCOM in that regard. Okay, so this is really, really, really good. We got 300 food. Uh, we've got a bunch of materials. And then we also got the uh, handgun. This is what would have been in the crate if we went to look at it. And there was also a med kit in there. So any crates that survive, uh, we get all the resources from. Now, once you finish a mission, this screen is going to pop up and say, hey, do you want to replenish soldiers? These are single-use grenades. Once we throw one, it's gone. So every time we throw a grenade, it actually costs us. Uh, that's very different from XCOM. So we're going to say, yes, let's manufacture this. This takes time to manufacture as well. Now, certain things don't. So if we go into manufacturing here, you'll see uh, med kits and uh, ammo clips are instant. Everything else takes time. 15 hours, 5 hours for grenade. It's not bad. Armor's a little bit longer. Full day in some situations. Right now, we only have access to, like, basic assault gear, heavy gear, and uh, sniper gear. And you can see, like, snipers that boost their accuracy. This gear is all about armor. And then your uh, basic assault stuff is kind of, like, middle of the road. Doesn't really have a ton of positives or negatives. It's just doesn't hinder them. Doesn't really help them that much. Um, there's also vehicles that we can make, and one of the things I'll be saving for is this Scarab. It's very strong. Uh, it takes up three slots in your Manticore, though. So, until we find a new ship with bigger capacity, because, yeah, that's a thing. You can have multiple ships going. Um, we're limited to six slots, and we can use those however we want. Now, we did take, if you look at our personnel here, uh, some of them took some health damage, some of them took stamina. Stamina decreases by one point for every turn in the mission, up to a maximum of 10. Once your guys have um, lowered stamina to certain points, then they lose action points going to the next mission. So the way that we heal this is we bring them back to the base, and we progress time at base while they're healing. Now, this is only going to work if you have a couple of facilities going on. Number one, you need your med bay. So while, this, while they're at base, either in the Manticore or just uh, unloaded from the Manticore, they're going to recover 4 HP per hour at this um, at this base. If we look at our living quarters, this provides two stamina points per hour for each living quarter in the base. So you can improve this. You can heal super fast, but you can see like slots are limited. I don't even know why these ones are just blacked out, but it uh, doesn't look like we can use them, which is going to limit our building uh in this base now every time you start this is different i always have the same starting things but it's in different areas and there's more or less of these things blacked out so let's spend some time spinning here you'll notice these guys are now recovering that stamina Research complete. we finished the phoenix archives after recovering the base and analyzing the data banks that have been left functional it's clear that phoenix point is now the only operating phoenix base there may be other bases out there, but we need to find them and bring them back online. There's no sign of Randall Symes III, but he's left something potentially useful for us. Okay. 
Randall Symes was the last leader of the Phoenix Project. His great-grandfather had been there when it was founded, and he was there to witness its end. When we took back Phoenix Point, we found his notes. In his final days, as the world collapsed around him, he'd been working frantically to understand the Pandora virus. Somewhere in the complicated history of the project, in decades of missions and investigations, there had to be an answer. His notes were damaged, too many of the files corrupted. But perhaps, if we could retrace his steps, we could figure out where his journey had taken him and what the answers he had discovered would mean for us. Okay, cool. So at key points throughout, uh, usually after researching things or making contact with certain uh, individuals and or mission types, we'll get these little uh, exposés, which are quite nice to kind of fill out the story. So Randall Symes III's notes indicate the existence of a private retreat owned by the Symes family, used as a place of meditation and research. It may contain information that could help us understand what Symes was trying to achieve in his final days. So now we have another mission, site added to the Geoscape, the Symes Retreat. If we look for it, if we click here, so this is pretty high up there. Uh, we might be able to get there from here, but um, that's a special mission that we'll want to tackle. Also, we now have an objective for finding a second Phoenix base and uh, completing the Haven recruitment protocols, which is new research that we now have access to. So this gives us a rough idea. The Phoenix base, the, the next one, is in Western Asia somewhere. So... We're just going to go north towards Symes and we'll start scanning in this area and explore as many sites as we can. Um, but we have new research too. So Haven Recruitment Protocols. This lets us recruit soldiers from the Havens. Leader of a reconnaissance team has proposed that we attempt to recruit capable people from the Havens. They may not share the technological know-how of Phoenix operatives, but have been battle-hardened by the horrors of the world. I'm going to move this in and that's going to become our top priority. Seeing as how we did pretty well on that scavenging site, we have a decent amount of food right now. We don't necessarily need the Disciples of Anu food from that research, but this is really good so that we can get a fifth uh, soldier going. We can also start doing autopsies on uh, the units that we run into. So this is an Arthron autopsy. They're among the earliest Pandorans encountered and have the most numerous. Uh, they have multiple mutations to adapt to different combat roles. Once we do this, we'll start getting access to different things that we can build. I think we can build uh, like machine guns based on what they are using. This takes a lot longer to uh, research as well. And then we have the Oniric Delirium Index. We could develop the, Oniri the Oniric Delirium Index concept proposed by Randall Symes III into a system for tracking the unusual mental phenomena caused by the Pandoran vi or presence. Delirium monitoring system goes online. Basically what this is, it's like a doomsday clock. And once it maxes out, the game is over. Um, this is a low priority research early on, in my opinion, uh, because all it does is tell us, hey, you're going to lose here. Uh, and there are ways that we can mitigate that as we go, but um, not a high priority. This is a top priority. So hopefully we can get that done. This person is almost healed up. Skadden's doing pretty well. And now everybody's healed, so we want to start going back out to these bases. Now... You might be thinking, okay, couldn't we just like drop off the people that are injured and then go fly around and do stuff? Totally. You can 100% do that. The problem is uh, there's these ambush missions and ambush missions are very scary because ambush missions are time limited and you have to survive a certain number of turns with tons of enemies running at you to kill you. Pretty scary. So let's keep uh, exploring these sites. Oh, cool. Okay, so we found the Sinedrians, too. At the Sinedrian haven of uh, Neo Djibouti, the situation is tense. Someone figured out that our open and democratic society would be easy to infiltrate and steal from. One of the haven's citizens tells our operatives. They pretended to join us and then made off with some critical research, which I assume they want to sell to another faction. The citizen sighs. I said they made off, but the truth is that they didn't get very far. In fact, they're stuck in the haven. But as you can imagine, this is a strange situation. These people pretend to be our friends. They lived in Neo Djibouti for months, all just to make a profit. I suppose old habits die hard. We could assist Sinedrian with this problem. So again, we meet a faction. We get uh, the ability to help them, which is going to boost our relationship with them. 
now we've got all three uh, factions uh, met, which is really cool. We've got New Jericho, Disciples of Anu, and Sinedrian. You'll notice it shows their attitude towards us. We're generally friendly with all of them right now. However, it also shows their relationships with the others. So New Jericho's um, view uh, or attitude towards Sinedrian, minus 9%, and towards the Disciples of Anu, minus 3%. And you can see for the other factions as well. They will have different missions that come up in here. Right now, they all basically wanted to target each other. And we can choose to side with certain factions because some of them have really cool technology that we want to develop. Now, I admittedly haven't gotten that deep into the game to experience things like that. Um, but over time, we'll start to see that some of their tech becomes available to us because we have a really high relationship with them. But we might want something from another group that our group hates and there could be some conflict there. So it gets pretty interesting. Uh, we'll throw the Synedrian um, research in here and then we'll start messing with this uh, priority wise soon. And then we'll come back and do these missions soonish as well. Right now, I just want to explore and then hopefully, boom, create a set of biometric and psyche valve tests in order to identify potential recruits. We need to locate havens with leaders favorable to our cause and barter any resources they want in order to secure our recruitment choices. It will probably be cheaper and easier for us to get recruits from havens with higher populations. So we can now recruit soldiers from havens and we unlock new research, which will unlock trade. So some trade between havens occurs, but it's a difficult and dangerous process. With our access to transportation, we're in a unique position to assist the different settlements by providing supplies. This might be a perfect opportunity to establish trade relations that would benefit all sides. We can now trade resources. So we're going to uh, prioritize this as well. Um, depending on what each haven has, um, that will determine what we can trade. So when they have, let's see if I can find an example. Food production. So here, this is somebody that we can get food from in exchange for materials or tech. And it's all, there's only those three things we need to manage, but it's something to keep in mind. Now, because our relationships with these guys across the board are pretty good, our cost to recruit this guy is a little bit lower. Plus he's a special class because he's coming from the uh, Disciples of Anu, right? Um, let's take a look here. This would cost 325. It would be an assault class, which is fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but it would be cool to get somebody that's a little bit more uh, unique. So let's go down here. Let's finish actually exploring this. There's another person here. It's indicated by this little icon. Once trade is done, we'll have more icons indicating what they can trade for. So this would be another heavy, Andrew Sweetie Vinnycomb. You'll notice some of their names are interesting because these are all backers of um, uh, their Kickstarter. And they're in here as soldier names. But I'm going to name them after you guys. So there we go. I think let's go here. And even though... <laughs> even though we might have some challenges getting this guy equipped. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, let's go and recruit them. Okay. This is... Oh yeah, this is saying... Okay, we've got the, uh, the mission if we want it. But really what I want to do is just recruit this soldier. Uh, training centers provide military force for the Haven and contribute to the protection of allied Havens within influence range. Disciples of Anu training zones are brutal arenas where berserkers are pumped with various chemicals to enhance their strength and bloodlust. Uh, so let's hire Tony Pesky Pescatori. He is now with us. We have to go there to do it. He's going to be on our um, Manticore. And his class is a berserker. Now, you're probably wondering, well, isn't that, like, really inefficient to get because you don't have any uh, melee weapons? It's like, yeah, pr pretty much. Yeah, pretty much it is. Um, <laughs> he can use handguns, though. And that's what we'll try and equip him with. However, we need to build all of this stuff for him. So he is going to be a melee class. Eventually, we're going to give him, like, really heavy armor gear. Um, but... For now, we're just going to build these basic sets of gear. And that's used pretty much all of our materials. Uh, a bunch of our tech is gone. And in a couple of days, we'll be able to uh, equip all of this gear on him. Okay. I think that's probably enough for, for day one. That's a lot to take in. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. 
Um, but I'm going to pause it here. When we come back, we'll probably have to do a couple of scans. Uh, I may end up just leaving this guy at the base and then trying one of these other missions, uh, one of the Haven uh, defense missions with just our four. Might be challenging, but if we're careful, it should be okay. Uh, we also need to set up a new area scan because this one's done. So we probably want to go north and start that. And then, uh, yeah, we'll just go from there. Also name this guy and have him ready to go for the next um, for the next mission. Now, strategically, it would have made more sense to hire somebody like this, somebody like an assault, because we have weapons that we can give them. Uh, but I wanted to show you some of the classes that are available here, and we'll just kind of build him out with what we have, and we'll do our absolute best. Uh, once promotions happen, I'll start showing you guys all of this and how it all works. And uh, yeah, we'll just go from there. I hope this was uh, a good first start to the campaign. If you guys wouldn't mind dropping a like on the video, it's the first one in the series. It helps me a lot. And uh, if you're new here, again, consider subscribing, hitting the bell because I'm going to be uploading these pretty regularly and then you'll get notified for new videos. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, leave your uh, soldier uh, names and a rough outline of what you'd like them to look like down in the comments below, and I'll just be picking randomly from there as well. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Bye for now.